Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar. This event is the first in a series to be held by a research partnership comprising E3G, SOA Centre for Sustainable Finance, um, CSEN and the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. My name is Kate Levick and I'm the Finance Programme Leader at E3G. So this event forms part of a project that's funded by the International Network for Sustainable Financial Policy Insights, Research and Exchange, more snappily known as INSPIRE. And I'd like to thank the INSPIRE Network for making this work possible. So under this project, between June and October 2020, we will examine the options available to central banks and finance ministers in order to respond to the current economic crisis in a way that is consistent with national commitments to environmental and sustainability goals. And on this slide, I've put the project website and our Twitter accounts, plus a hashtag that you can use if you want to tweet about this event. So in this first webinar, we're going to be asking how can the responses of monetary and financial authorities to the COVID-19 crisis support social and environmental sustainability? And in that context, we hope that we'll be able to explore the following questions. So firstly, what is the particular role of central banks and financial supervisors in responding to the current economic crisis and in contributing to a sustainable recovery? Secondly, what are the tools and opportunities available to these actors and what are the limits to their power? And thirdly, what differences exist between the challenges and opportunities in different geographies? And following this webinar, we'll make a recording available online on the project website, and we will also produce a short policy brief in coming weeks that's based on the discussion we had today and the inputs of the different participants. So we're delighted to have a fantastic lineup of speakers today. Um, first of all, I'll be introducing Mangal Goswami, the Executive Director of the Southeast Asian Central Banks Research and Training Centre. Um, then I'll be um, introducing Morgan de Pred, Head of the NGFS Secretariat and the Deputy Head of Financial Stability at Banque de France. And finally, Ulrich Voltz, the Founding Director of the SOA Sustainable Finance Centre. So after these presentations, we'll have a Q&A session. And um, first of all, we'll hear from Dimitri Shengelis, one of our project partners. He's the project leader for the Wealth Economy at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. You're all warmly invited to submit questions by the Q&A function throughout the presentations. And in that Q&A session, we'll be sharing those with the speakers. So I'd li now like to introduce our first speaker. And um, just to check, I can't see this with the view I have, but just to make sure all other speakers have turned off their cameras until the Q&A, unless they are speaking. So first of all, I'd like to introduce um, Mangal Goswami. So Mangal Goswami is currently the Executive Director at the CSIN Centre in Kuala Lumpur. He was the Deputy Director at the IMF South Asia Regional Training and Technical Assistance Centre in New Delhi. He also served as the Deputy Director of the IMF Singapore Regional Training Institute during June 2010 to December 2016. He has a range of experience with IMF macro and macro financial capacity development work in Asia. Prior to joining the STI, he was a senior economist in the Monetary and Capital Markets Department of the IMF. And notably, he was a member of selected IMF working groups during the global financial crisis. He participated in the IMF surveillance work on large complex financial institutions and was part of several financial sector assessment programs. Before joining the IMF, he was an economist at ABN Amro Bank in Singapore during the Asian financial crisis. And he served in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City in the US. So I'd like to welcome Mangal and please um, do share your thoughts with us. Thank you, Keith. <clears throat> and I wanted to first uh, thank the INSPIRE project and the collaborators uh, for bringing season, the season center into this. Um, I'll first say a few words about uh, the center um, and our role here in, in this whole issue of climate change. Um, we, the center, the season center and season is, is an institution that is uh, one of the most inclusive in, in the region, given that we have 19 member central banks, um, including China, India, the whole of ASEAN and others. We also have uh, associate members and observers. So we pretty much span all of Asia and we have this network. Um, why are we in this, uh, in this project and why are we in this climate change? Because we clearly know that climate change is macro critical. And, and these macro critical issues have an implication on financial risk and macro financial risk. Uh, so our role would be to provide uh, one, uh, thought leadership in this area uh, of climate risk and related financial risk. And second, uh, we are also in the, in the main business of uh, capacity building. 
Um, so we'll be working with, uh, uh, notably with, uh, uh, with NGFS and in, in, in training some of the supervisors in the region on, on climate related risks and how to, how to look at prudential regulation and so on and so forth. So that's how we come in into, into play. Um, so let me quickly uh, turn into my first slide. Um, uh, turn to my first slide, um, Kate, if you can uh, go to the first slide, please. <clears throat> Hopefully. Are you? Yes, you can go, go ahead to the first slide, please. Yes, I may have a technical issue with this. My God, hold on a second. Sure, no problem. I'll keep talking while uh, while Kate tries to. The, the first slide is nothing but just a picture of um, of how um, you know uh, every country we have seen globally has been affected by COVID nineteen, and this picture pretty much shows uh, you know Malaysia has also been affected uh, by this pandemic. And this picture is showing the, the, the policy response, the, the impact of policy response. The very first day was uh, not so clear skies because activity was still rampant. But then by the 43rd day, you see clear skies. And clearly, um, you know, uh, the lockdown uh, impacted uh, the environment and it became much cleaner. But of course, you know, uh, given that the, the, the the scale of the health crisis, and now it's becoming more manageable. Um, of course, going forward, one has to balance this risk uh, from from taking going from the healthcare crisis to to sort of shifting gears to economic stimulus and to managing this. And if you go to the next slide, Kate, um, uh, what I would like to highlight here is that these are imponderable imponderables about the risks uh, that pandemics bring you know pandemics uh, typically are associated with uh, with risks that are um, high impact but low probability these are sort of the we call them uh, tail fat tail risks so beyond impacting lives and livelihood pandemics and natural disasters are associated with uh, regression to the tail of macro and uh, macro and financial outcomes and here's an example of what I mean. Uh, you know, the, the red line, the red uh, sort of uh, distribution here uh, shows the, the return on, on the US stock returns of US corporate sector stocks uh, during the uh, COVID-19 period. And you can clearly see relative to the blue line that these, uh, these returns are not normal. These returns are fat tail. And such is the case for other activities related, uh, macro activities. Uh, you talk about the real sector, you talk about uh, you know, unemployment in the real sector, GDP and the likes. They all have elements of what we call uh, sort of significant sort of skewness uh, uh, towards the left tail uh, with, with uh, very, very significant outcomes. So, so the key question here is how do you manage this kind of a tail risk? Um, of course, you know, it would have been in hindsight, it would have been great to manage to have had the foresight of such pandemics and to manage this tail in a more preemptive way. Uh, but that said, you know, given that that was not done, uh, we clearly have to manage this risk as it is right now. So going forward, um, if you go to the next uh, slide, Kate, uh, you can see how the impact of this tail risk is actually uh, bearing out in the real economy. Um, you can see that the output losses, these are the, the IMF's forecast of uh, forward-looking output losses relative to his previous forecast. You can see the significant dip uh, in output, uh, in the level of output, both for advanced countries as well as emerging market countries. Uh, and if you look at Asia, uh, clearly, you know that has been the glo growth leader in this um, in globally. But even for Asia, uh, the fund is 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 projecting that uh, you know um, you know for this pro this project these projections are clearly uh, subject to further revisions. But uh, for Asia, it's likely to be that growth will will pretty much be flat or zero. Um, um, for 2020. So pretty much this tail risk is, is taking its toll, not just on lives, but on the macro economy. So the scale of this disruption of out, output of financial losses and, and the likes 
clearly begs the question as to how should policy respond? Should we just go ahead and, and, and have all kinds of policy levers act and just indiscriminately sort of try to get ourselves out of this? Or do we need more of a thought process and making sure that this, this massive stimulus that we will see that is coming um, is, is much more sort of, uh, you know, has a greater impact and has more sustainable growth? So this is the big question. So next slide, please, Kate. Um, so um, in order to look at this question, it's good to see what, what the public is thinking. McKenzie did a survey and, and asked this question as to um, how do you see this economic recovery and how do you see the role of climate change being prioritized as part of the DNA of this recovery um, from COVID-19? And you can see on average, pretty much countries across the board have agreed that uh, agree that to a large extent, um, uh, climate change policies should be part of the recovery policy uh, coming out of the COVID-19. That's an important lesson for policymakers. Um, so, so what do we see going forward? Um, you know, clearly a lot of things have been happening. Next slide, Kate. A uh, lot of things have been happening. Um, but, but in order to put a bit of a framework to this, you know, what are the high level principles of policy response uh, from a, in order to come out of this, this, um, uh, this crisis and something that is more environmentally sustainable, uh, given that the scale of recovery and scale of policies for this recovery will be significant. So why not take advantage of this and make this recovery more sustainable through various, uh, you know, uh, uh, levers such as one would be anchoring the rebuilding of the econ global economy with longer term resilience. As we learned from this crisis that it's not just efficiency that is important, it is also resilience that is important, resilience to tail risk, uh, especially to climate change and pandemics. Second is to strengthen uh, the environmental sustainability part of policy design of policy, the framework design, especially in monetary, financial, and fiscal. We can get into more of this in the Q&A section as to what we mean by this, but we will see some examples of this. And third, of course, not to waste this opportunity, but to also capitalize and, and uh, take this opportunity to put a realistic price of risk on carbon emission, preferably at a broader scale across the globe. It's easier said than done, but these are sort of the high level principles that, that could sort of be important in, in keeping uh, um, our, uh, the, the response more sustainable over a longer period of time. So next slide, please, uh, please Kate. So now we know that already, uh, you know, all, all the countries involved are beginning to sort of uh, scale up the stimulus part uh, after managing the immediate uh, dislocations of financial markets, of real economy. Uh, monetary policy has been working extremely hard with lowering policy rates, injecting liquidity, expansion of balance sheets, uh, intervening also in the in the in the corporate bond market or, or the corporate market uh, because clearly corporates are uh, under distress given high rate of uh, you know economic uh, both a demand shock and a and a, and a supply shock uh, but in this little green box what you see is more of the kind of central bank and regulatory uh, financial assistance which is focusing on sort of the more vulnerable segment of the economy, sectors of the economy, notably the SMEs and the small and the, and the very, very, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, very important players in the economy in, in many countries. Uh, so regulators have a very important role and we can talk more about it, but the bottom line here is that clearly there needs to be some kind of an overarching regulatory forbearance because if you apply very stringent rules of the game now, you're likely to see many bankruptcies. Therefore, some relaxation of prudential, macro prudential measures, prudential measures, um, uh, some forbearance on the, on the impairment of assets and the likes uh, are already taking shape in many countries. But can monetary policy actually do all this heavy lifting? 
Uh, well, clearly not, because one, you know, in many countries, especially the developed countries, we are seeing uh, again that the, they're hitting the interest rates are hitting the zero lower bound, and more more than that, you know, clearly fiscal policy as a, and structural policies have very important roles to play. So, going to the next slide, Kate. Um, we clearly see that uh, countries have, have scaled up their fiscal response. Um, fiscal uh, policy is clearly in the forefront now. Uh, there is an element clearly in the beginning of the healthcare spending that is very much need that was very much needed to manage this, but it's still more is needed. On top of that, we have seen uh, advanced economies um, on uh, on aggregate basis have had about eight percent, over eight percent of fiscal stimulus. This is just purely, um, you know, above the line stimulus. Um, on the other hand, we have seen emerging markets uh, stimulus not as significant, but but you see new new uh, new announcements every day from ministries of finances. But uh, they are also ramping up their their fiscal support uh, for the economy. Same for low income economies. But of course, uh, developing and emerging markets are sort of somewhat constrained in their financing because you know they they have finance they could have financing constraints. Not all emerging markets, but some may. And of course, for low income countries, that would be a binding constraint. That said, an important element of this fiscal response is the fact that uh, research shows that you know, investment, uh, the fiscal multiplier, which means that you know, one unit of, 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 a, of a certain fiscal stimulus can have more bang for the buck, uh, we can see that fiscal multipliers on investments, the investment multipliers are very powerful under such circumstances where there is significant economic slack and, uh, and monetary policy is accommodated. So what does this mean? This means that clearly fiscal response more on the investment side would, would be probably what the doctor ordered in this case, uh, apart from other policies, but this is an important policy that could be uh, you know, uh, sort of the, the area where it also overlaps with this common goal of making this recovery a bit more of a, sus a more sustainable recovery. So the um, so the next slide, uh, take, please. Um, as we can see in the next slide, um, what what already is becoming uh, becoming the narrative is that you know we need to have this recovery, uh, which is a greener recovery, because we need to take this opportunity to move uh, quickly um, uh, towards a more sustainable, cleaner, climate resilient. Um, uh, sort of recovery. Therefore, I think there will be more talk about this. Morgan will talk about this. Um, investment in climate resilient infrastructure, renewable infrastructure, fiscal incentives to lower the carbon footprint for heavy industries, so on and so forth. So the idea is sort of to lean towards more greener investments. Um, as we already know that uh, hopefully, uh, you know, the multiplier is going to be uh, significant and at the same time uh, there is no myth about you know cleaner uh, uh, about green investments uh, there is a lot of research showing that indeed green investments can uh, create jobs um, in some cases more than uh, what the regular uh, non-green investments can um, and of course uh, we need finance to help us with this. We need green finance to mobilize the funds. Uh, banks, asset managers need to incorporate in their DNA uh, risk uh, sort of changes to their governance framework that bring in climate risk uh, at the outset so that going forward, we already have this embedded in, 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 in the policy framework. Um, so as much so much so also for for financial regulators supervisors to incorporate climate risk in their financial risk assessment um, so uh, indeed uh, you know we are seeing that uh, supervisors are already uh, sort of uh, you know uh, letting their financial institutions know that you do have uh, you know, counter cyclical buffers which you can use, and we are not going to hold you. Uh, you know, to uh, you can use this and be be more. Uh, you can provide more credit to the economy under such duress. So I think I'll just stop there at this point and 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 uh, you know.
engage again later on during the Q&A. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much, Mangal. Um, I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, um, Morgan Bepre, and I apologise for my French pronunciation, um, is Deputy Head of the Financial Stability Department at the Banque de France and also serves as the Head of the Network for Greening the Financial System, the NGFS Secretariat. He joined the Banque de France in 2005 and served in the Payment and Settlement System Department and as Deputy Head of the Macro Prudential Division. Other professional experience includes a secondment as Deputy Head of the Financial Stability Unit within the French Treasury Department and Technical Assistance Missions for the IMF. Morgan holds an MBA from ESSEC Business School, graduated from the Institut d'Etudes Politiques de Paris and studied at the Harvard Extension School. So Morgan, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Kate. Great French accent, by the way. Um, thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah? I think so. Yes, beautiful. Um, perfect. So, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, as you may, as you may have seen this morning in the press, um, this morning in Europe, uh, there was an op-ed that was published this morning in the in the Guardian, and that was co-signed by Mark Carney, Andrew Bailey, uh, the French Governor Philippe de Gallo, and Frank Alderson, who is the chair of the NGFS. And this op-ed um, is calling to um, to seize the opportunity of the COVID-19 crisis to meet climate challenge. And this is completely topical to the discussion that we are having today. And um, it, it, actually, we, we kind of planned the publication of this op-ed so that it could match with this uh, webinar today. Um, so really great to have the opportunity to exchange with you guys on, on that particular topic. I would like to make uh, maybe three points, if you allow me. The first point is about uh, the role of central banks and the way uh, they need to they need to find a proper positioning in that particular debate. Clearly, the first line of defense in the current crisis is um, is for governments. Uh, they are the ones in charge. They are the ones in charge of using the, their public spending um, to mitigate the crisis, to keep the economy uh, afloat, and also to pave the way for the recovery. Um, so, as we see it within the NGFS, um, central banks have an important role to play, but the, the first line of defense is government, and we are the second line of defense. However, being the second line of defense doesn't mean that it is that this issue of green recovery is a secondary topic, it's, it's just the opposite. And I have to say, I have to pay tribute to our chair, Frank Ellison. Uh, from the very beginning of this COVID-19 crisis, he, he really felt it was necessary for us to start thinking about how not to waste this crisis and how to make sure we could contribute to a green recovery and the role of central banks in that particular uh, uh, endeavor. And the difficulty for us within the NGFS is that um, we are now 66 members. Uh, and 66 members, it means 66 different mandates. And for central bankers, the key part of their work is to make sure they will stick to their mandate and they stay within their legal mandate. Um, and so the first question you ask yourself as a central banker is, uh, what can I do within my mandate to contribute to uh, the green recovery that is absolutely needed uh, after this COVID-19 crisis? And um, I have to say, the answer is, is quite clear. Um, if you stick to this approach, that was the NGFS approach, uh, that is to say, climate risk is a source of financial risk and because it is a, so a source of financial risk it, it falls squarely within the financial stability mandate of central banks and so if you want to discharge your mandate it, it is not just that you need to, to pay attention to that but you have to pay attention to that risk and clearly if we follow this line um, and, and we and we start to think about the way grid recovery will look like you have to simply for the sake of financial stability to include the climate risk in the global package um, basically for two reasons uh, first uh, what you want to what you want to avoid as a central banker is to uh, have some some uh, building up of vulnerabilities in the financial system and uh, if all the public money that's being used public investment that's being used right now or there is planned to be used in the near future is used to finance some brown industries or industries which in the future uh, will represent a risk 
uh, for, for the economy, then you're just waiting, you're just wasting public money because you are using public money to build up a risk, transition risk, that will later on materialize and which will call for further public money to be mitigated. So clearly, you have to take on board in this green recovery approach climate risks because otherwise you're just um, uh, planting the seeding, uh, planting the seeds of the of the of the future crisis, which could even be uh, much much worse than this one. So this is the key point for us. What we think in terms of financial risk is still there, and we have to include that in the green recovery package. The second point also um, on that. Uh, question of financial risk is if you look back and this is a point that was made by Mangal a bit earlier if you if you look back at the other six or eight weeks that we lived you realize that of course very quickly the CO2 emissions uh, went down in many countries because of the lockdown approach but uh, to be honest is it really the example uh, of a, a well-managed and orderly transition to a low carbon economy well I, I guess we probably agree it's probably not the case uh, and so it calls for an orderly managed um, and, and not disruptive way of, of transitioning to a low carbon economy. And if we want to do that, we need to start early. It's probably already too late, but we need to start as soon as possible and we need to manage that. And um, setting the climate priority aside in the green recovery plan is clearly again a recipe for another uh, disorderly and disruptive transition that we'll have to go through in the in the coming years um, the last the third and last point i would like to make in in this uh, brief introduction is throughout this this crisis the ngfs has continued to work uh, this is not a priority that we decided to to just you know set aside and and or it's not like we would have decided to slow down the pace it's, it's just the opposite uh, you may have seen that we published last week two deliverables, one dedicated to um, uh, the measurement of the risk differentials between various types of assets, green assets, brown assets, and neutral assets. And we try to uh, collect a number of data, evidence, and, and, and observe in practice whether there is a, a, a risk um, in, in the a differential in the, in the risk um, measurement between those assets. Um, and also we published a guide on supervisory practices, which is also a, a, a handbook to be used by supervisors to make sure they can learn um, and leapfrog and, 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 and gain in their uh, improve their their um, their knowledge uh, much quicker and learn from the experience of the others. So at the end of the day, it's still a key priority for us. We clearly want to continue working on this. We're working on a statement that, that would be released probably in the, in the beginning of um, of next week. And we certainly not want to set aside the climate priority in the face of the current crisis. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Morgan. So I'd now like to introduce our third speaker. Um, Ulrich Voltz is the founding director of the SOAS Centre for Sustainable Finance and reader in economics at SOAS University of London. Um, he's also a senior research fellow at the German Development Institute and the honorary professor of economics at the University of Leipzig. He's a director of the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment and serves on the advisory council of the Asian Development Bank Institute and the board of SUFINDA, the Sustainable Finance Data Initiative. And Ulrich was the 2017 Banque de France chair at IHES in Paris. He also taught at Peking University, Kobe University, Hertie School of Governance, Freie University at Berlin, Central University of Finance and Economics in Beijing and the Institute of Developing Economies in Tokyo. He spent stints working at the European Central Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and has held visiting positions at the universities of Oxford and Birmingham, the ECB, Bank Indonesia and I <laughs> Sorry, Ayama Gakuin University in Tokyo. And so Ulrich was part of the UN inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system and has advised several governments, central banks, international institutions and development agencies on matters of sustainable finance and development. So Uli, we're very keen to hear what you're going to share with us now. Thank you, Kate. And uh, apologies, if, had I known that, that the whole bio will be read out, I should have provided a shorter one. But um, So, um, a pleasure to, to follow up after Morgan and, and uh, Mangal. And uh, indeed, there's very little um, one can uh, disagree with uh, in what they said. Um, but I would like to, to emphasize 
that there's an awful lot that central banks and supervisors actually can do uh, to align crisis responses with sustainability goals and uh, climate goals in particular. Uh, Kate, please, uh, can you go to the next slide? So, again, central banks and also supervisors, but central banks in particular, have to play a, a crucial role um, in responding to the crisis. And um, that applies both to the immediate stabilization phase and also the subsequent recovery phase. And it's very clear that the policies that are adopted during the crisis uh, will, um, in many cases, have profound impacts on long term outcomes. So investments that are undertaken now uh, will, in many cases, have lock in effects uh, that may adversely affect uh, climate change. Um, Crisis response measures are clearly uh, now geared toward short-term outcomes, but they need to really have uh, in view long-term climate and sustainability goals uh, so that our responses do contribute proactively uh, to uh, a just transition. And uh, if you could go to the next one, please. And I would say there are four points in particular that uh, central banks and supervisors need to uh, watch out for. Um, to start with, uh, central banks need to make sure that they themselves don't um, build up um, climate risk in their own balance sheet. Um, so asset purchase programs in particular, um, they need to, to account for climate risk. And I'll, I'll get back to asset purchase programs uh, a bit later on, as these are obviously uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, in the focus right now. Um, central banks and supervisors also need to ensure uh, that the financial institutions that they regulate uh, don't load up um, extra climate risk during uh, the current period um, and uh, so that this does not undermine, as Morgan said, the uh, uh, um, stability of the financial system and also the economy at large. And then, last but not least, uh, central banks and supervisors need to uh, try as far as they can within their mandate to uh, support the scaling up of sustainable investment in line with sustainability goals. Next one, please. So uh, both Mangal and Morgan already uh, emphasized uh, the uh, importance of, of um, climate risk as a source for uh, financial, uh, potential source of financial instability. And um, it's very important to emphasize that uh, liquidity enhancing stimulus measures that are not aligned with sustainability objectives um, can uh, and will contribute to the build-up uh, of these climate related risks in the portfolios of individual institutions and the economy and financial systems at large. And um, uh, we've already heard that um, central banks have been and supervisors have been uh, uh, quite active in easing um, uh, prudential instruments in a counter-cyclical way, which um, clearly has been appropriate, um, but doing so without accounting for uh, climate risk or other sustainability risk um, can uh, lead to an increase of these risks uh, down the road. And this has to be avoided by all means. And importantly, um, again, uh, if certain investments get financed now during the recovery because of easing off of certain instruments, um, uh, this will create lock-in effects uh, that will run contrary to our uh, climate goals. Um, so I would say that while we of course have to be very pragmatic and, and we don't want to introduce uh, brutal new prudential requirements in the midst of, of, of uh, a great financial crisis and econ economic crisis, um, I would say that it's absolutely crucial that central banks and supervisors um, signal very clearly their concerns about the build-up of climate-related financial risks and that they, um, for example, announce uh, that they will be introducing sooner than later um, uh, climate-related stress testing, um, that uh, they will require mandatory disclosure of climate-related risks and so on. And even though these may not uh, be implemented immediately, but um, sig uh, signaling that they uh, that these things are around the corner and uh, the NGFS uh, member institutions have indeed over the past couple of years worked a lot on uh, climate related financial risks and, and have basically come to a conclusion that they need to act 
Um, and uh, this must not be um, uh, pushed down the road because um, we have very little time uh, to achieve climate goals. And, and so um, the financial sector needs to really uh, adjust. And, and this has to start now. Um, please move to the next one. And there are indeed a lot of things that central banks and uh, supervisors could do to uh, align uh, their toolkit with climate and sustainability goals. Um, I'm just uh, uh, listing a few points here. Um, for example, collateral frameworks can be adjusted uh, to account for climate or sustainability risks. Um, for instance, um, uh, carbon intensive uh, uh, assets could uh, uh, get a haircut uh, in collateral frameworks or they could be outright excluded. Um, and uh, I know this uh, is sometimes considered uh, somewhat controversial, but um, this is purely on the grounds of prudential uh, risk. Um, so it's not really a political um, issue, I would say. I, I would say this is a, a, a very uh, um, kind of uh, an issue that, that is very directly re related to the prudential mandate of central banks and supervisors. Uh, refinancing operations, for example, could also be aligned with sustainability goals. Um, reserve requirements, risk weights can be differentiated according to whatever uh, climate or sustainability uh, measures you fancy. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, central banks uh, that engage in asset purchase programs um, uh, could align these with sustainability goals. And um, many of you will have uh, seen that Greenpeace yesterday uh, published a note on the asset purchases of the European Central Bank over the last couple of weeks. And according to their estimates, uh, out of the 30 billion euro um, of corporate asset, uh, assets that the, the ECB bought, um, almost 8 billion uh, were directly linked to uh, fossil fuels. And I would say this is absolutely what should not happen. And um, uh, Morgan rightly pointed out that we should not use public money uh, to prop up um, uh, sectors that run contrary uh, to climate and sustainability goals. And I would say, unfortunately, this is a clear example of public money created by the European Central Bank uh, that is used to finance uh, um, uh, corporates that are um, at the center of the problem. Um, so I'm not talking about uh, starting green QE programs, which uh, most central bankers would uh, not want to see because they see that very controversial, but I think um, uh, not uh, uh, purchasing uh, um, uh, very clearly Brown acids uh, would be an important aspect. Um, next one, please. Um, so this is actually actually just now the the um, advertisement uh, uh, intermission um, uh, with Nick uh, Robbins and Simon Dickow. Um, I've been working on a, a paper on a toolbox of sustainable crisis response measures for central banks and supervisors, which we will. Uh, uh, publish uh, soon, where we uh, go in much greater detail in, into different things central banks could do. But uh, to finish, I'd just like to emphasize that there is really a lot that central banks and supervisors uh, can proactively do, and many of these things they also should proactively do, um, to make sure uh, that the financial sector and the economy does not load up on, on uh, carbon risk or other sustainability risk, and they, uh, the financial sector uh, is part of the solution to uh, the recovery, but also um, uh, the, the climate crisis uh, that is looming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eli. Um That's fantastic. So um, we're now going to move to the second part of the webinar and um, the Q&A section. I see that questions have been coming through in the chat. Um, please do continue to send those through. Um, I'm going to move first of all for an initial response to um, Dimitri St. Gallus, who is the project leader for the Wealth Economy Project at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. 
at the University of Cambridge and although I have been told off for giving too long bios I should probably mention that Dimitri has also held the roles of Principal Research Fellow and Co-Head of Policy at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and he headed the Stern Review team at the Office of Climate Change in London and was a senior economist on that review and also previously held the role of Head of Economic Forecasting at the UK Treasury. Thank you Dimitri. Superb, thank you Kate. Let me know if you can't hear me otherwise I will uh, persevere and plough on. Um, fantastic presentations. I had a couple of thoughts um, that I noted down. I mean, all of this testifies to the importance of monetary policy in the current environment. Um, and it's, of course, important to recognize that uh, the broad money supply is endogenous. Nick Caldwell famously observed that uh, the annual surge in the money supply each Christmas um, doesn't mean that Christmas causes, uh, uh, that the money supply causes Christmas, rather it's the other way round. Um, and so in a confidence crisis when interest rates are already near their uh, zero bounds, as is the case right now, both the fiscal and the monetary authorities need to act to sustain uh, spending. And in such a confidence crisis, you know, the, the need to address the climate challenge and build uh, a resilient and inclusive economy properly pursued might be exactly the medicine that's required uh, in the post-COVID-19 uh, environment. And the reason for that is because it allows you to frame a vision, a coherent vision of a much better uh, future. Um, you know, the, the term New Deal is much abused these days, but there's very much something kind of Rooseveltian um, about this. Uh, and a key objective in any recovery, but perhaps more especially in this one, is the need to stabilize expectations and channel surplus divide, sa desired saving into productive investment. We already had a problem with excess uh, desired saving even prior to the crisis. This is why. Uh, neutral, risk-free, uh, real interest rates were close to or below zero even before we went into recession. Now, clearly, we also have Keynesian uh, savings, precautionary savings, which are added into the situation once we come out of um, the uh, lockdown, uh, and indeed, even in the lockdown, there's forced savings in many areas, which need to be put to good use. And until we stimulate investment, that's going to be very difficult to do. Um, we've written papers with Nick Stern, Joe Stiglitz, and others uh, on uh, the fact that you know, sustainable, resilient, inclusive investments have some very appealing short and long run characteristics. In the short run, um, things like uh, you know a lot of clean infrastructure investment tends to be very labor intensive and not very uh, import intensive. So it has good short run multiplier properties. Um, and in the long run, um, these structural investments in key assets often uh, lead to more productive uh, uh, production. We see that in uh, electricity generation and uh, you know, vehicles and elsewhere, which actually, and also in energy efficiency and resource efficiency more generally, which lowers long-term costs. So um, in the long run, this is about investing in the right key assets to make the economy resilient to future shocks, to expand capacity and to foster uh, productivity growth. So it has a supply side as well as a short-run uh, demand effect. From a sort of prudential mandate of central banks, this is about you know investing in the right assets, the kinds of stuff that Mark Carney and the FSB and the uh, Charles Force for Climate-Related Disclosures and um, the Network for Greening the Financial System have talked about. It's about limiting not only climate risk, but actually perhaps uh, more importantly, litigation risk and of course, uh, transition risk. It's about not locking into the wrong physical assets, which make it very difficult to decarbonize the economy. It's about, human capital enabling workers um, affected by change um, to transition to a low carbon economy by providing the skills and jobs necessary for the 21st century it's about knowledge capital which we've <laughs> I have my three-year-old uh, son is is close by in the background um which of course induces a lot of innovation we've seen this already in renewables uh, and battery technologies uh, my colleague Antoine de Chalapetre also tells you that there are huge spillovers from one sector to another. When you combine these short and long run uh, effects, you get what, Cal, uh, what Nick, uh, John Hicks called a, a super multiplier, which at times of recessions means you can generate very rapid um, growth uh, in the economy by stimulating both these um, effects and framing a vision that tends to generate confidence effects and uh, boost investment. Mangal. Uh, talked about it. He provided some multipliers, which, you know, if anything, I think are on the low, the low side. If you look at some of the 
studies of the multipliers that applied post the financial crash of 2008, whether, you know, for example, um, Orberg and Gorchenko or Blanchard and Lay at the IMF, they came up with multipliers of uh, really close to two and a half. That means, you know, every 1% of borrowed money invested in the economy uh, in terms of GDP generates uh, perhaps two and a half percent of extra GDP. We, in our paper with Joe Stiglitz and Nick Stone, we found that that number could be as high as 3% when you combine short and long run effects. So I think, you know, the importance of monetary policy makers and fiscal policy makers working together um, is vital in, uh, you know, enabling the economy uh, of the 21st century to, uh, you know, both uh, boost demand in the short run and expand capacity in the long run. Final thought, Ulrich already touched on this very clearly, but, you know, we wrote a paper um, with Sini Matakainen and um, Emmanuel uh, Campigno, Campiglio in 2017, um, uh, talking about um, exactly what uh, Ulrich talked about, which is the, that the asset purchase program of central banks can very often be skewed towards high carbon sectors. And it's really important we don't repeat that uh, mistake again. It's not about green QE, as Ulrich rightly said. It's about keeping the playing field level and not by, uh, biasing it uh, in favor of fossil fuels and thereby enhancing the kinds of risks that uh, central banks are worried about. I'll stop there, but um, I do think you know the role of uh, both uh, green investment and stimulus and monetary policy are are crucially and integrally linked at this uh, important juncture. Thank you very much, Dimitri. And um, I'd like to invite the other speakers to now put on their cameras as well, so that we can have a, a visible panel. And I'm going to bring in a few questions from the chat. So we do have quite a few coming in. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to try and group them a little. So um, we definitely have a cluster that's around monetary policy. So I'm going to read a few of them and it'd be great if one or two of the panel members could then take them. I think we'll probably look to Morgan in the first instance and then if anybody else would like to add to those. So one question from Carlo Atienza, is there already an existing framework for incorporating environmental impact to monetary policies? And um, one from Mohammed Hakim Yaffa, um, the literature on climate risk as a source of financial stability is well established. However, would you be able to say the same for monetary stability, i.e. climate risk as a source of monetary instability? Um, Pierre Monin has asked, are there central banks which report on how their monetary policy decisions are aligned with Paris Agreement goals? And I think maybe I'll hold it with Oh no, one more down here. Um, also, do you think current monetary policy framework requires major revamping to respond to climate risks? So I'll take that group together and Morgan, it'd be great to get a response from you in the first instance on those. Sure, sure. Um, so just to answer a few, a few of the questions there, um, the question of the, the impact of climate change on monetary policy framework is something that is being investigated. Uh, it's probably less advanced than in other areas, such as, for example, uh, in supervision or scenario analysis. But um, within the NGFS, there is a specific work stream, uh, work stream three, which is chaired by um, Zabina Maldorov from the Bundesbank. And this work stream is going to release by the end of this month, so by the end of June, a paper which brings together um, all the relevant literature um, analysis um, that has that were relevant uh, in in that particular relationship between climate risk and monetary policy framework. So it's going to be a, a descriptive paper. It's not going to be a policy oriented paper, but it's a first step um, because at the end of the day, when you when you start thinking about this, you realize that ultimately in a in a world that will be of, uh, above two degrees, uh, you, you're necessarily going to have an impact on um, a number of macroeconomic variables and, and uh, aggregates. And, and, and you may imagine it's, it's going to have an impact on, on the supply shocks. And, and so ultimately, it's not completely illogical to think that it's going to have an impact as well on your monetary policy targets. And so this paper will be a collection of, of uh, various analysis and, and uh, and, and put together and, and published. So it means that uh, we are working on it, even though, uh, as you may know, it's probably a little bit more sensitive because it's, it's something that is 
very much related to the specific mandates of central banks and and uh, and all central banks do not necessarily have the same mandate and the same instruments so we need to find a way to make sure that, that we have sufficient commonalities in that particular uh, space uh, still on monetary policy well what is clear is that um, the, the, the monetary policy response to the crisis uh, was a, an emergency package in a way uh, and maybe we should distinguish between the emergency phase and the recovery phase um, clearly in March the, the the objective was to keep the financial system afloat and, and prevent uh, dislocation of, of, of some market segments so the, the, the response was massive there was a huge uh, backstop in liquidity uh, undifferentiated and this is probably something that, that was understandable from the perspective of the of the urgent situation at that time. Uh, it doesn't mean, though, that going forward uh, we should lose sight of the objective of, of incorporating climate risks in uh, a monetary policy framework. And in particular, um, my, my view on that and the, the view of the Eurosystem and, and uh, Banque de France is that a very promising uh, way to do that is to incorporate that within the collateral framework um, because uh, if you follow this risk-based approach then you may say when I take a collateral a, a specific security as a collateral then I need to reflect uh, and, and this security is particularly exposed to climate change then I need to reflect that in my collateral framework um, so clearly this is something that is being investigated um, both within the NGFS and also as far as I know within the euro system as well um, of course, it's it's um, it's a politically sensitive and, and complex issue, um, but um, in any case, it's not something that we set aside and that we don't want to to examine anymore. Uh, there's still some some appetite to understand better and improve the analytical framework. Maybe I can weigh in here uh, uh, with a very quick uh, follow up of what Morgan said. Um, I think, as you mentioned, uh, the risk transmission channels uh, are much better understood in the context of uh, financial stability uh, rather than more uh, in the context of a monetary policy. Uh, you know, that, that said, of course, you know, uh, you can think about uh, to embed climate risk within monetary policy framework along the lines of, you know, looking at a supply shock. Uh, so that's probably as far as we have gone so far and, and more needs to be done. But before more needs to be done, we need a lot more uh, information on climate risk, this, uh, on climate risk itself, the diagnostics for climate risk. I think the data as to what are the data needs has to be much more uh, important before we really dive into the analysis uh, and putting that into monetary policy framework. Uh, so that would be my end. Uh, sort of intervention. Great, thank you very much, Mangal. Just in the interest of time, I think I might move to a different question set at this point. Um, so, um, Uli, there was one particularly for you. What would you respond to the market neutrality argument that is so often used against excluding brown assets? It seems as if the EI ECB is waiting for the taxonomy to legitimise more sustainable asset purchases. That's from Joram Gerard. And we actually had a linked question. Um, which was from um, from OMFIF, um, which says, thank you for great presentations. Um, how can central banks navigate the need to provide immediate stimulus now, given high market expectations for it, versus channeling these to sustainable industries? Is there enough supply of sustainable assets to invest in? For example, the green bond market is very small. And if central banks have to purchase assets and supply of sustainable assets is not there, what can they do? How can they filter out high carbon sectors? Okay, thank you. And, and uh, actually, the market neutra neutrality question followed up on what I wanted to chip in uh, into the monetary policy debate. Um, I think it's very important to realise that there is no thing such as market neutrality. I mean, the, the notion that that uh, central bank policy is, is uh, just neutral, um, I think that's a fallacy. Um, monetary policy always has implications, um, be it uh, social or, I mean, uh, there will always be allocative um, distributional implications, and that just has to be realized. We just need to analyze uh, what they are. Um, I mean, we did uh, speak a bit about, and, and uh, thanks to, to Dimitri for following up uh, on the asset purchase programs. Uh, I mean, that, that obviously is a very clear example 
um, uh, where um, central, bank, uh, central bank policy is uh, kind of cementing the status quo, which is uh, for the time being, uh, financial markets are still heavily uh, tilted towards uh, carbon uh, intensive businesses. And, and um, uh, so this is in a way, uh, if, if you want to think about market neutrality, um, uh, this supposed market neutrality is cementing uh, the market failure that we're uh, seeing right now. And I refer back to uh, Lord Stern, who calls, uh, called uh, uh, climate change the, the largest market uh, failure ever. And uh, by basically um, pretending to neutral uh, to be neutral and, and, and kind of maintain the status quo, um, we are cementing this market failure. So that's a problem. Um, on, on the supply of assets, yeah, of course, there, um, a lot of people saying, well, um, aligning monetary policy uh, with sustainability means, okay, central banks need to build, uh, to, to buy green bonds. Of course, they should buy green bonds, but that's not just uh, the main thing. Uh, to start with, I would say, um, at least as important as what gets financed is what does not get financed. So um, having, um, uh, 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 so basically excluding uh, carbon uh, intensive high risk assets, uh, not only from central bank asset purchases, but also uh, from, the, uh, what, what, from the balance sheets of financial institutions, I think that is really crucial. And of course, um, by uh, kind of um, financing less brown, um, you will automatically um, uh, enable more green investment. Great, thank you, Uli. Um, so I'm going to um, bring forward just a couple more questions now, as we're getting fairly close to the hour. Um, I'm going to bring through a question that was specifically for Morgan. And um, let me just find this again. Right, so the question was, Uli, Ulrich outlined a range of actions that central banks can take to green monetary policy and guide banks' lending. How close are central banks to actually implementing these measures? How soon do you think they could be put into place, given the urgency of the present moment? What are the gaps and how can civil society help to accelerate implementation? So that's a question from Thomas Lorber. Um, there's actually a linked question that came in a little earlier, um, which was around the speed at which um, emerging economies can take up some of these measures. So this was from Jonas Balthasar. Transitioning towards this framework cannot be immediate, especially for emerging economies. In your experience, how long will be the transition period for the financial environment to consider these factors and be prepared to adopt them. Um, so that, those primarily for Morgan, but if Mangal or Dimitri wants to come in quickly afterwards, they're also welcome to do that. Yeah, so I, I will I will be brief. Um, but actually, central, so, um, central banks have different um, kind of portfolios and um, they have started to implement some specific SRI uh, investment policies in their non-monetary portfolios. There was a, a report from the NGFS published last year in October that uh, described the various practices. So I think there is a, an expertise that is there um, and progressively they're learning to select the assets, measure the temperatures of their portfolio and uh, of portfolios. Um, uh, but, but, but then the problem is, um, I mean, central banks face the same obstacles as any other private sector investors. Um, uh, you need to have the proper data, um, you need to find a proper disclosure, and the both usually uh, the both topics are related. Um, uh, you do not necessarily, for example, if you want to introduce climate risks in your collateral framework, how can you measure it? Uh, the time horizon of your repo operation is, of course, not aligned with the horizon of, of the risk. So. We, we actually do face the same kind of methodological problems that you guys, that the private sector people are facing. Um, so we are learning, we are trying to work with the, with the expert consultancies and, and the private sector people. But I would say the learning, the learning curve is still quite steep um, uh, and we are aware of this. Okay, thank you, Morgan. Mangal or Dimitri? Mangal. Dimitri, go first. Uh, sorry. Well, I, I, sorry, just on, I, there we go. Uh, just picking up on uh, just a couple of the issues, very, very briefly. I mean, I, I totally agree. This is more of a sort of prudential uh, financial stability question than a monetary policy question. But I would say that you know, at this present time, 
where you know uh, the depth of the recession, the impact of confidence, and the fact that you know there is a liquidity trap with uh, interest rates at the zero bound uh, does require an integration of fiscal and monetary policy uh, and a sort of you know a complementary approach between the two policymakers, rather than one that's just based on reaction functions. Uh, whereby I think the monetary authorities and the fiscal authorities need to work together. Uh, to determine the nature of investment that is financed, if some of those um, you know, prudential risks are to be contained. Um, now, obviously, this has issues relating to central bank mandates. Um, I'm not so bothered about that, so long as central banks remain operationally independent, so they are not in any way uh, you know, uh, forced um, to finance uh, public spending, uh, which they would otherwise be reluctant to do, subject to their mandates. And I think there's institutional questions that can be thought about uh, to th and that can be worked around to make this operational. But I, I will leave it at that. Oh, I suppose the other, other thing I would say in terms of uh, risk, it's not just about disclosure uh, of company uh, uh, emissions. Uh, it's also about um, you know taking a risk management and hedging strategy, which means um, looking at to the future and asking companies to take a forward look to see if their activities are uh, compatible with a low carbon 21st century economy. Those are my two thoughts. Thanks, Dimitri. And Mangal, are you going? Are you happy to round us off? Just very quickly, first on this issue of um, investing in green bonds and the likes, you know, talking to asset managers, it, it pretty much is clear that you don't have to have that uh, financing that is earmarked as a green green instrument. You know, uh, there are a lot of asset managers who look at companies bottom up and they look at how what is the green part of their dna of their of their of their overall uh, culture of their business model so it does not have to be a green bond for you to be able to find uh, to be throw your capital or, or deploy your capital so you need to be much more discerning in terms of the company's profile or or the instrument's profile in the sense that they may be somewhere in the spectrum of this entire you know brown to green and they're evolving rapidly towards the greener side so that that you know it cannot be binary so that's one point i would like to make uh, the second is that on on emerging markets clearly the, the the green finance part of it is evolving very rapidly and if anything uh, emerging markets I have a lot of new economy element to it. Therefore, a lot of this new economy is much more nimble and they are sort of uh, uh, latching on to more, more of this green finance. So I wouldn't say it's a handicap. I would say it's more of, a, uh, of an advantage that you are at a, at a point where you can develop your financial markets deeper using um, you know, the green finance. Thank you, Mangal. I think that's an absolutely fantastic point for us to end on. So thank you. That was perfect. Um, we have hit the hour. Um, it's been a great discussion, short but, but sweet and very interesting. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and participants. I know Morgan had to drop off slightly early to make it to another webinar. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who participated and watched and who gave questions in the chat, even though we didn't manage to get to them all. We will certainly be considering all of those when we look at the policy brief that we'll write following this meeting. So thank you very much and we look forward to the next one of these sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.